All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first ever Cody Show. I am so excited to be here today. This is my first personal podcast I've talked about for years. And today I'm ultra grateful because I have two of my mentors here, uh, Randy Davis and Sean Sutton, for my first podcast. So thank you guys for joining us and uh, excited to kind of dive in. Yeah. Yeah. We are going to talk about business today. We're going to talk about entrepreneurship. We're going to talk about sales and we're going to dive into anything fun along the way. So with that, I want to set some ground rules for the podcast. Number one, have fun. Number two, keep it real and authentic. I want this podcast to be very authentic. So with that in mind, I want to say a fun fact. Harvard and Berkeley have done studies that say that people who use profanity or cuss show signs of higher intelligence and are typically higher performance. So if you feel so inclined to drop an F-bomb, don't worry. We will, we will bleep it out later and, and roll with this. A lot of bleeps in your ear, John. <laughs> Let the shit talking begin. So, uh, Randy, I wanted to start with you. I met you when you were a vice president at Mattress King. Yep. And when I moved out to Colorado, that's really my first official sales job. I've been doing different sales things throughout my life, but that was my first organized sales position that I got uh, hired on for. And um, super excited to have, have you for that. But your, your experience goes far beyond Mattress King. And you've been an executive in the mattress industry for how long? Oh, 30 years now, something like that. 30 years? Yeah, 35 actually, Jeez. 33. And I'm so fired up Old man. because as of, what's it been, six months? Yeah, yeah. yeah as of about six months ago. It'll be uh, five and a half months actually, so. Yeah, you started your own mattress company, which I think everybody who's been in contact with you and done business with you in some extent has all been waiting for this day for a very long time. Yeah, I got a lot of uh, it's about time type things from, from <laughs> my friends and vendors and everybody else. So, but no, it's been great. It's been fun. That's aw- awesome. And uh, actually, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about your roadmap and, and really your experience as, as being an executive in the industry for so long and what you've kind of, what got you to, to, to the point of opening your own store? I think overall, in a nutshell, like I said, I've been in the industry for over 30 years, but, you know, started off in the waterbed business when, uh, you know, waterbeds were uh, rocking and rolling and having some fun. But, uh, um, you know, <laughs> had the, I've had uh, the great pleasure of working with a lot of good companies that are still some of the behemoths here in Colorado still. So, uh, you know, everybody knows Barney Visser is uh, Furniture Row and whatnot, but they were Bixer waterbeds back in the day when I started with them. So, wow. you know, that's where I was selling waterbeds. I had the pleasure of, well, even before uh, Furniture Row, I, I opened up kids' beds for them and uh, uh, over by Casa Bonita, which was uh, an interesting little fun thing to do. But uh, went to Houston, Texas, opened up Furniture Row, the first concept of that. Wow. Um, uh, which was uh, three years of, uh, don't get me wrong, for people that are in Texas. Me and Texas just don't get along. I just say, <laughs> I'm so glad to come back home. But uh, <laughs> came back home and uh, opened up Denver Mattress Forum. Uh, but I was with Barney for about nine years, and it was just great times. There was, a, you talk about uh, uh, learning curves and things that uh, I really needed because I was 21, 22 at the time when I started, so didn't know anything. But uh a lot of my beliefs and standards started in those first nine and ten years, and then uh, did some high-end furniture with Homestead House, which was an institution here for a while until Mr. Smith passed away. And then David and I teamed up with Mattress King in the early or first part of 2000 and uh, ran Mattress King for 14 years. Got up to 70 stores before we got bought out by uh, Mattress Firm, and then I was the national director for those guys for five years, and went to Appliance Factory for a little bit. But when COVID hit, I just got tired of uh, doing a lot of good things for a lot of companies, but not really doing it for myself. So I just said, why not? Let's just do this. And so with the support of my wife, we opened up the Better Mattress. It's been a two-year process of trying to get it all up and running with, uh, again, with COVID, with supply problems and all that other stuff with vendors. But, uh, you know, this uh, this last back half of the year has been fun. It's been great. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. That's fantastic. And... You know, Randy has a special place in my heart because he really introduced me. just talked about this before the podcast, but he really introduced me into formalized uh, working for a formal solar, uh, formal sales company. Just did my solar podcast, a formal uh, sales company and put me through my first sales training and also gave me my first sales book, which was the little red book of selling from Jeffrey Gittimer. He had a little library, Randy had a little library of uh, selling books and, you know, 
I think I was probably around 20 years old when I joined Mattress King and I was starving for that. I wanted to learn anything and everything I could do to be better to a point where it was probably really annoying for everybody around me. But Randy helped embrace that and uh, fed me the knowledge I was desperately looking for, worked with me in the showrooms and taught me a lot. So learned a lot of my sales skills I have today and attributes from from uh, RD over here. So I appreciate it. Yeah. With that being said, I want to pass it over to Sean. Sean, I met Sean uh, when he owned Sleep, Sleep Nation and um, he recruited me over from Mattress Firm at the time. Uh, to come help him run all of Sleep Nation, which at the time was two stores. We grew that to five, five stores. Were we at five stores? Five, five stores. And uh, really, Sean has done such an incredible job and been a mentor to me on selling, but mostly on business. I've learned so much about business. And he owned what I think, especially when I went over to work with him, the most innovative mattress store in the market. When everybody was pitching the big name brands, he had made an entire private lineup um, with eco-friendly products that was just different from what everybody else had done. And Sean, you've been in uh, you've been in the mattress industry for how long? June first of nineteen ninety eight. Wow. So eons ago. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was 24, 25, something like that. I started at Mattress Firm. Um, I was actually I was selling paint in the paint department at Sears and lived underneath in an apartment building, lived underneath two of the guys that ran Mattress Firm stores, um, John Anton, uh, Darren Indorf. They did. They uh, ultimately went on to owning this mar- uh, market, being franchise owners here in, in Denver of Mattress Firm. But um, they uh, they came to my roommate and myself and said, "Hey, we're 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 hiring at Mattress Firm. Maybe you guys should should uh, should come check it out." And um, really, at the at the time, um, I had a pretty easy gig, and I was really looking for the easiest thing that I could do hungover, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, at any rate, I started working for, uh, for mattress firm. I worked there for five years and then went and worked at mattress King where I'm at RD, um, here. I worked there for five years and then went back to mattress firm for two years. Um, my, uh, Girlfriend at the time, who ultimately went on to be my wife, um, we, uh, you know, she got pregnant and we had a little baby on the on the way and stuff like that. And I really thought that it's it's kind of a, a good time to maybe branch out and try my own thing, for for better or for worse. Um, and so I uh, I took about a year or so to kind of develop my concept and uh we we had a list of names and ultimately landed with sleep nation because it sounded bigger than what it was <laughs> fake it till you make it type, <laughs> type of deal um and uh yeah went out went out on our own uh we opened um 11 11 11 so on, all right on, on veterans day uh in 2011 and we opened our first store our park meadows store um, and then went on in 2014 and opened our Cherry Creek store. Um, and that's, uh, that's where I met you. And I met you, you were, you were working and selling against me up the street. Yep. The old Colorado so Boulevard. The old Colora- yeah. The yeah. old Colorado Boulevard. That's awesome. I actually, uh, didn't know that Nissa was pregnant. Um, when you started, did she have your first born Asher when you started Sleep Nation? So we had him in September of 2011 and then opened the store in November. We were actually, we we wanted to try to beat Ikea because Ikea opened that summer and, uh, you know, the build out of the store and various other things uh, took a little bit longer than anticipated. So your your um, store took longer to put together than Ikea? Yeah. It's slightly. Yeah. Okay. Slightly. Oh, and as a side note, this will work for me before she worked for Sean. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there you go. 
Yeah. Also, as a side note, Randy forced us out of, of, uh, <laughs> of the mattress king because he's such a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, I got to get away from this That's dude. That's right. As, <laughs> as a uh, – so, so I cash my son a year in, uh, was a year and three months ago. And I cannot imagine the stress of opening a business with a newborn, um, and having the pressure to be able to provide for your family and being a new dad is, is scary. I blame both of you guys. Cause neither of you warned me how hard it is, um, to have a kid It's what, far more challenging. <laughs> yes. It's far more challenging than I had uh, thought. And something that being a business owner and being a father have in common is they are both easily twice as hard as you think they're going to be, but easily twice as rewarding as you think it'll be. Sure. Um, So how scary was that for you to start Sleep Nation right when you had a a kid? (laughs) Um. I'm I'm not sure which was scarier, the kid or the the kid or the business. (laughs) Uh, to be to be clear, but um, it uh, yeah it was it was challenging. What just one of those things that if anything that's worth doing is hard, right? So uh, at least how that that's that's how I felt, and uh, it was it was incredibly scary for me. Yeah, I I can imagine. So what pushed you? What pushed you through that? What helped you to get through that? Um, so really the desire to uh to provide and and succeed really you know it's funny you said that sean because i know for myself when i started when i was 22 we had our kids my daughter was born right when i started big sur i was 22 wow. and back in there was no base pay or anything we were 100 percent commission and commission yeah. was only four percent and you know you're selling 99 dollars water beds so <laughs> do the math you know and <laughs> A lot of water heads. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the the one thing about, and I'm sure you guys can probably attest for it too, there's two different worlds. There's the commission-minded world, and then there is the salary, paycheck, hourly people, right? Mm-hmm. My wife was from that world, and I'm from the commission world. And as a commission salesperson, you don't think about what my hourly pay is. You're just trying to make a difference every minute, every day, and forget about what just happened and go forward. Mm. And, you know, a lot of times... You know, at that age, and you know, talk about being scared. Yeah, you know, now maybe because we're all growing up at the same time. You know, we're not really realizing what we're doing, so we're all fumbling around with anything else. But just trying to make sure that you know that whole essence of living paycheck to paycheck was as about as real as you can get. And, yes. You know, plenty of weeks, plenty of times. You know, the old uh, minimum wage was back then was uh, three dollars and twenty five cents. <laughs> Uh, it was what, uh, wait, it was a struggle. Nineteen nineteen twenty one. Yeah, yeah. eighty nine. Eighty nine. Yeah, so I was I was negative two years old. At there that you point. go. <laughs> Wasn't even thought about. <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, crazy. You actually just uh, brought something up I wanted to touch on today, and that is commission based salespeople. Um, do you think that, that, what do you, what are your guys' thoughts on salespeople being on commission and are you believers in that? And is that a, uh, if, if you are, why? You want to go first? Go ahead. I am a big believer in commission salespeople. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, in fact, it almost irritates me a little bit when I hear commercials and people say, Hey, we're not on commission, you know, because to me, if you have an individual that is working hard for themselves and hard for the consumer, they care more. 100%. If someone's already been paid up front, they really don't. There is the lack of sincerity that they act like they care about you, mm-hmm. but they really don't care if you make the right decision, you know, and not only just for them, but you think about it as business owners for ourselves, the reputation part of it, because if, if there's not a lot of ownership in it and they're just doing it because they've already got paid, that affects the back end just as much as it does on the front end. So I would take a hungry, commission-minded individual any day than a complacent um, uh, hourly person every day of the week. Mm, I love that. A hundred percent agree with that. And, and I, I, if where you're talking about is Shane Co as purposely why I didn't buy my wedding ring for there for Rachel from there, because I walked in there and I could feel that they weren't on commission and that they didn't actually care until I walked into a jewelry store that I could feel that they were invested in my success and my happiness and what I purchased. 
um, which made a really big difference to me. And I feel the same way. If I hear somebody's not on a place, is not on commission, I'll almost avoid it for lack of service. I feel I'm going to get, get there. Sean, do you have anything to add to that? Um, well, yeah, I think the, your point with uh, not necessarily just Shane Company, but any company that does not have commission salespeople, I think that, and, and particularly those that use that in their in their messaging to the consumer, they think that that's what the consumer wants to hear because that's what a lot of customers want to hear. They don't think that they're going to be threatened. They don't think that they're going to get strong-armed into buying whatever product or service that it is. But the reality, I think, is a commissioned salesperson will work harder for the customer than a non-commissioned salesperson. Also work harder for the company than a non-commissioned salesperson because their pay and their livelihood depends on it. Completely agree. Mm-hmm. 100% love that. That's great. So I skipped a little out of order on my agenda here, but I'm really excited about this next question. It's geared towards you. Randy. Oh, great. <laughs> Let's go back in time. You're running a meeting. It's the first of the month. Janet Jackson time. Yeah, baby. It's <laughs> Janet Jackson that. time. What have you done for me lately? Yeah. Just brought that up uh, just two days ago with my boys. You did? Of course. It's December 1st. <laughs> Tell me why that statement rings so important to you and has been your signature catchphrase for so long. Well, literally just because of the essence of what she said. Now, don't get me wrong. Janet Jackson is Janet Jackson, right? I've already told my wife if she knocked at my door, then maybe, you know, hey, I'm not going to apologize. But but overall, that phrase, you know, I know what you used to do for me, but, you know, what have you done for me lately, Mm -hmm. is the essence of selling because... As commission-minded or in the business of trying to earn people's business, I don't care how great a sale was or how bad a situation was, you have to have short-term thinking and get on to the next one, especially for our consumers because they deserve it as well. They Mm -hmm. deserve to want to know that uh, that your time is spent with me and not that you're, you know, all excited or upset about what just happened take care of me right now. And that's the same thing even obviously for at the beginning of the month for a store, for a company, regardless of how great it is. doesn't mean that you forget, you measure it, Mm -hmm. but you still, you're back at zero. Back at zero. And time to roll again. So it's time. What have you done? Yes. What have you done? Janet Jackson time. And the ultimate Janet Jackson time is coming up here January 1 of the new year. So I always reset and uh, what happened last year doesn't matter anymore, right? Right. It's about what you're going to do this year. Yep. It, ma- it matters as a measuring tool against what you're doing this year, but that's the only only way. You know, it's funny, uh, Cody, just real quick. You know, you talk about books and stuff that you love. There is a book, and I really can't, and I'm just killing myself. I can't remember the author, but it's, uh, it's a quick read. It's called Go For No. It's probably the best-selling mm-hmm. book I've ever read in my life. It is... Literally the essence of, it's not our job to say no, it's our consumer's job. But a lot of times, salespeople get in their way of their own success because they're saying no before anything ever happens. You know, and just even in that Janet Jackson regard of, uh, you may be selling, maybe you've got uh, one of your salespeople just sold three houses, you know, and they're all excited about themselves. But the question really is, okay, why didn't you sell four? You know, or mm-hmm. why didn't you why didn't you add this? Well, they, they spent this amount of money. Well, that's not your job to, you know, to stop them. It's the consumer's job. It's just our job to ask. Mm-hmm. And if there's a no, guess what? If there's a no answer, it just gives us an opportunity to ask why no. So it's it is just one of the best books I ever read. Quick read. You know, it's like in five hundred font, so anybody that doesn't like to read, <laughs> you can you know, you can get through it in about an hour and a half, but it is yeah, uh, it's it's an it's a must read in my opinion. I read that one. I love that book. Yeah, that's a great a uh, great book. And I'll never forget another thing I really like about the Janet Jackson time is it keeps you humble. Yes. And I remember being a young salesperson. Um, I think it was this has happened to me twice with two different co managers. Once with Brian Caton, we crushed it. We broke the company record in that store at least in Colorado Boulevard. And I came into that first of the month meeting. I had a new tie on, a new shirt on. I was feeling good. And I was waiting for Randy to give me a pat on the back and say, like, you crushed it last month. And it was, Cody, relax. It's Janet Jackson time. And it was a good way to humble myself down and deflate my ego, which is what needed to happen for me to go out there and perform that next month. Another time it happened with Tom Live. Tom Live listens to this. 
which we're all disappointed in you for being too scared yeah, to where you at Tommy T. But uh, that was that was one of the things. So um, appreciate that. Thanks for diving into that. For Sean, one thing that I wanted, one of the things I've been most influenced influenced by that you taught me is the power of keeping your finger on the pulse in business and why that's important. Can you kind of dive into what that means to you and why that's been such an instrumental part in your success in business? Uh, you want to avoid complacency. I mean, um, I think a lot of com- companies um, and people in general get, um, they just get kind of set in their ways and they think that their their product or their service or whatever is better than everybody else's. Um, when in reality, it's it's not necessarily better. It's just, you know, you want to go for being different, necessarily not better, but I don't want to run down that tangent. But um, uh, but really, you need, you need to know. You need to focus on what you're doing, first and foremost, but you also need to know what other people are doing in your industry, competitors, all of that. You need to know their product better than they know their product. Um, just because it's 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 good business. It's just good, even from a salesperson standpoint, not even a business standpoint, but, but your salespeople should know your competitors' products better than those salespeople know their own products. Sure. Um, and it's just by keeping your finger on the pulse as far as what other companies are, are doing, um, it can help you be able to pivot so to speak if you need to and kind of like a i think randy actually told me this analogy the uh you have to be a speedboat instead of a a, a cruise ship because speed boats can twist and turn a lot faster mm-hmm. and speed than uh than than larger ships and the larger that the ship is the harder it is for it to turn and zig and zag and stuff and um the smaller businesses you can kind of by keeping your finger on the pulse, you can uh, you can zig and zag a lot faster and make modifications. Yeah, that's crucial in business, right? Especially in this modern economy where things twist and turn and change so fast, it's important that you can uh, you can be able to do that. And no, having your finger on the pulse, knowing what's coming or having an idea of what's coming is is important for that. So um, to segue, this is a question for both of you guys or whoever wants to take the question: What is the best piece of sales advice you've ever been been told? Oh, <clears throat> I guess to make it in a nutshell is just want the business. Want the business. That's that's really probably is as simplistic as you can get. You know, Sean was just talking about complacency, and I think even when you get uh, uh, competent salespeople mm-hmm. that, uh, and whether it be the environment or the store that they're in, or just their, or maybe they are really good at what they do in their craft. Um, there is sometimes a, a tendency, it's human nature for people to get complacent about, this is my expectation, I've reached my plateau, so to speak. So, But if you're hungry, if you really want the business, if you want to be more, if you want to be better, that's all you got to think about. And that kind of derives it a little bit with the Janet Jackson thing, but wanting the business and wanting to help, right? I mean, that's really what it all is, wanting to serve, wanting to do those things, but it's that one part in the beginning. Um, you know, it is a little, I don't, I wouldn't say disappointing, but you know, for a small business, uh, it, it gets exciting. Like what uh, Sean's saying that there's a lot of big national companies out there. They don't want the business anymore. They're just complacent about being there. Yeah. And so this town, Sean knows, I mean, at one point in time, Denver had at least 16 to 18 different mattress stores in this town. And now we're down to like five, you know, and it comes down, it's a new shift. It's a new paradigm shift again for Colorado. And uh, some of the bigger guys, a uh, little older, they're a little complacent, but this town likes people that want their business. And so if you want it, take it. I love that. So if you are a salesperson, how do you maintain that hunger? What, te- what, what things have you learned in your history that keep you hungry? Because complacency does leak in, but you got to do something to push yourself back out. Well, I think, you know, you said a little bit of it, Codes, is, uh, you know, you got to be humble. You know, mm-hmm. you got to be aggressive and don't get me wrong, being arrogant a little bit as a salesperson is a great trait too. I mean, 
Domi over here is uh, he he's the king of that. He's uh, <laughs> he'd walk into any any sh- if we were ever having a Saturday morning meeting. I don't care how large the meeting was. Sean knew when he walked in the door that you know what I'm in the one percent category, and if you want to knock me off, it's your job to knock me off. Not that he was arrogant that he's like above and better than everybody, but he just knew his talents. And there's nothing wrong with that. And, and when it permeates, you know, because as, you know, and I can attest for it is that when Sean, it's, when it's his time to perform with consumers, he's as about as relatable and as sincere as uh, some of the best guys that I've ever known. And that's, uh, I know that's a huge reason for his success is just because Sean enjoys what he does. So that's, that's a big part of wanting that business is that, and you don't beat yourself up over if, you know, something doesn't go your way, you know, because that's what this life's all about anyway. I mean, there's roller coasters, so you just got to get up and strap up your shoes again and go for it. And that's what uh, that's what the best of us do. Yeah, I love that. And so you're saying saying uh, uh, one of the tricks is to be competitive. Yes. With that, with there goes or the yeah, to be able to to have that have that view of I'm keeping my stature and I'm hungry for it. You got to come knock me off. Yeah. As kind of a, a trick for that. I love that. Sean? Fantasy football. Fantasy football. And by the way, <laughs> uh, fun fact about Sean, he actually invented the Conor McGregor walk before Conor McGregor even knew he had it. <laughs> so with that, Sean, what's your best sales advice you've ever been told? Uh, that it's not about me. It's about the customer. So if, if you make it about the customer, you're going to have better results. And if you make it about you for, I mean, um, nobody gives a shit. If you think that you're better than other people, that you think that your company has a better product, has a better service, nobody cares. They want to know what you're going to do to better their lives, their situation. I agree. And the less as salespeople, and I found anyway, the less I talk about how great I am or the company is, the better I did. The more questions I ask the customer and get them talking, that is when my successes came because it got them involved um, and not me. Love that. Two ears, one mouth, right? Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. People ask me all the time. I say the stuff in our sales meetings uh, two years, one mouth, all these different things. They always go, where do you come up with this shit? And I say, the mattress industry, they're full of it. They got all these kinds of stuff like that. But um, I love that. And, you know, I, I just kind of sparked something else for me in recruiting. Because one thing both of you have done an exceptional job um, is recruiting. You you guys both had top talent in your stores. Uh, in your stores. And... Um, yeah, I mean, to to uh, some of the my arch nem- nemesis, Drew, um, he was the guy that had this the the mattress store across the street from mine, um, was is probably one of the best mattress salespeople in the state, if not the country. And Randy, you were able to recruit him and Dustin, and Dustin's also a top tier one percent um, salesperson. And Sean, you were able to get Wallace. Um, you were able to get Ken. Um, you were able to get. Me, you, yeah. Who, who, who else? Uh, I mean, if I miss anybody with Sleep Nation that we had that was all star players, Art, Art, yeah, Art, Art Cooper, Art Cooper, hundred percent, yeah. Absolutely. So, what have you guys done to be able? What do you attribute your success in being able to? Because I think for you guys, your recruiting wasn't aggressive. It was more of an attracting of these top players to your to your team. The recruiting game started a long time ago with building respect and um, and attracting them. What, what do you attribute your success and be able to recruit such top talent to your to your stores? Well, I think, you know, first and foremost is trial and error. I mean, again, don't get me wrong. I mean, one thing that we always say, we, uh, there's a lot of people that interview well. 100%. So uh, the other part of it is like what Sean is saying, it's more behind the actions behind the words, right? So... Uh, but as interviewees or interviewers, you have to, you've got to invest a little bit more. You know, as Sean was talking about investing in the people. It's the same thing with your staff. you got to learn a little bit. Not only do you got to learn something about them, but they really do need to know a little bit about where you're coming from as well and what their expectations are going to be. And then once it starts, stay true to the expectations. 
and mm-hmm. and that's where and for you know again as we said ABC people whether they're growing in the right place you know for a Cody for a Sean as great as a month that you can have I know that I want to keep you hungry and keep you excited so if I just give in to say oh hey you're the greatest in the world then that's going to hurt you more than help you it's going to be hey come on man you know what you only did this i expected this and just to have that little bit of an edge <laughs> that little bit of competitiveness to go further but the other part of it too is in our business is that you know we we do deal with people so not just our consumers we're dealing with staff members too mm-hmm. and if they can't get if there's no synergy you know it you know what is the old age old analogy about the one bad apple I mean, it really is true, and that's and that sometimes you know, as owners or you know, managers, whatever, there is it's it's worse when you've had that one individual that is, you know is a bad apple, mm-hmm. and you've got a, it's surrounded by great apples, but you don't pull that apple uh, soon enough, and you let it fester a little bit. That can hurt you just as much as help. So, I think it's just trial and error, but also stay true, stay in the pulse. You know, be involved with your people. Yeah, love that, Sean. What would you attribute it to? I just took those. I took the bad apples from Randy, actually, from, from Mattress Kitty Mattress. Thank you, Shine. <laughs> is, is essentially what I... Uh, no, what was the question again? <laughs> you, you've recruited really strong salespeople. How'd you do it? Oh, um, I, you know, I, I think it's, it was basically selling them on the story or the vision of... A small company instead of a a larger um, mm. company. Um, you know, I can again just speaking for me with uh, even just starting Sleep Nation when it was just myself and and my my wife before we even had any employees. Um, it was about being different. You know what I mean? I said it a little earlier ago. It's about not being better. It's about being different. Um, when uh, when I started. There was, what was there, Randy? There was American Furniture Warehouse. There was Denver Mattress. There was Mattress Firm. There was Mattress King, who basically dominated the market. But I felt they all carried kind of the same thing. They all had the same, um, the same brands, um, everything. And if we were going to be successful, we had to not do that. We had to create kind of our own brand and our own story and... People thought I was crazy, and I probably was, but we created created our own own brand, own system, own story. Um, and I think that salespeople are looking for that too. They're looking for a, something to set themselves apart, to be different. Um, that compelling story, why should you buy from me as opposed to somebody else? Um, you know, they're, they're, they, I think they want to get on board with that too. Yeah, Sean, you're a master at creating vision and selling vision, especially to well to both customers and to your sales reps that have worked for you. I've seen you do both, pitching the vision of what that nice mattress is going to do for them, and for sales reps, you pitched vision to me better than anybody has in my life. How, what's your What's your secret with that? How do you How do you How do you invest time and figure out what vision is going to get someone excited and that aligns with your goal? Because I've learned in business. That's not about the company vision, right? It's about the employee, the your staff members' vision and how you align them um, together. How have you How have you done that? Or does that just come natural to you? Um, well, really, it's it's whether whether you're recruiting or whether you're selling a product or a service. It's about kind of selling the sizzle and not the steak, so so to speak. What's that mean, so, Sean? <laughs> um, well, at its at its base level, it's sell. Um, you're selling the benefits over the over the features um, of any product or, or any service or, or anything like that. Um, and it's the same with salespeople. Your your or, or any staff at all. You're you're selling the vision of the company mm-hmm. as opposed to you know what you're actually. Getting does that? I'm not even sure if that makes any sense. Uh, yeah, so it makes sense to me, but it uh, yeah, um, yeah. 
I think I'm picking up what you're putting down. Selling the selling the benefits over the features. Selling you're you're figuring out what the benefits are to the employee, and what what really drives them and makes them hungry and able to pitch that in a way that makes sense instead of telling them it's not about the comp plan, it's not about your hours, it's about these are the things that you can grow into and the things that you can become, the benefits uh, of the of the vision, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so another thing, Randy, I've been just dying. There's, there's so much stuff I can dive into with you that are so much deeper than this, but these are the things that have buried my curiosity for a better part of a decade now. How do you measure good selling weather? <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> good selling weather. So back in the day, we go to a meeting, and Randy Davis, especially if it was a holiday weekend. Holiday weekends are busier in mattress stores. Memorial Day, Veterans Day, President's Day, all those. So Randy would go up there. He'd have all the competitors' ads. He'd throw them up and tell them why this one's not as good as ours or this sale's not as good as ours. And then he would say, all right, guys, but the big thing is, it is perfect selling weather out there today. And we always wondered what the hell that meant. Well, you know, I'm a, it's interesting. It's funny that you think about that. Uh, but I, I, you know, to go back, I'm I'm a chess player. I love I love the whole strategy behind chess. Okay. And I say that because weather is just another part of the game. And depending on the weekend or the weather, let's just say it's seasonal, right? Okay. Today, prime example. It's 55 degrees today, and one thing that you know, first thing we did this morning is what a lot of retail stores don't do is we opened our doors up. It's not just to have the open sign on. The door is open, which means it's a mental subliminal thing that says, come on in. There's so many stores that don't do that, and people walk by that store all the time. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how many times either when we have the door closed, well, people will just do the whole looky-loo and try to look into the window or look into the door to see what we have. But when the doors open, they come in. Mm -hmm. So weather-wise, obviously it's for like inviting. a – What's that? Yeah, it's more inviting. inviting. And, you know, depending on the holidays, you take – you know, for mattress, uh, we'll take Labor Day, which is one of our – obviously the Super Bowl of uh, uh, mattresses. You would love that it would be uh, kind of an overcast, not, not really raining, but just kind of a gloom and doom because – you know, if it's not, if families can't go out and spend a lot of time at the parks and whatever, then they're going to be doing what they love to do, which is to go shop, right? Okay. The other big the part of it, which is, yeah, yeah. And it's great right now, like, uh, you know, and I hate to say this, but the Broncos suck. So it's the perfect weather for us because on Sundays, nobody is watching the Bronco game. They'd rather be away from negativity. So they go out and do something that is more positive. Three weeks. Yes. I can't, I can't watch it. Exactly. Anymore. So those those little things you just you just play it by ear, you know. It's you know the Memorial Day. You would hope that it is again gloom and doom, not mm -hmm. sunny and bright because you know it just depends. It doesn't mean that you won't get the business. You're just not going to probably get it that day, or it, it you just have a better opportunity if the weather is in your favor. I think it doesn't matter what the weather is outside. It's always the perfect weather. <laughs> it's always it, it's it's all it, it's perspective it could be 80 degrees and sunny and even though people are true, true, out true. playing it at the park you tell your sales staff listen it's 80 it's 80 90 degrees out there nobody wants to be outside messing around at the park they want to be inside in air conditioning shopping for a bed and then you can you twist that at the same time if it's rain if, it, if it's raining hey nobody wants to be outside they want to be inside shopping it's all perspective it's your glass being half full instead of half empty because a lot of salespeople will also use if if business is crappy they'll oh, yeah. use the weather as an excuse oh, yeah. oh it's snowing outside no <laughs> yeah exactly i mean if if your glass is half full you always find an excuse Right. Or want to find excuses as to why business sucks. Well, the funny part about that, you say that too, Sean, especially in a cold weather state like we have, because we, you guys know that if in retail, especially in the industry, if it's snowing and you get that person that has what I call stinking thinking, saying, oh, it's, you know, it's bad, whatever, say, look, guess what? The good news is if somebody calls you or somebody walks in, there's a reason they're out. So it's a glorious day for you because that means you've got a 90 or 80% chance, whatever you want to put it, to, to earn that person's business right then and there because no one's going to go in this weather if they didn't have a reason to get out in the first place. So take advantage of it. Yeah, I love that. I love that. So 
If you guys were to have a 20 year old person come in, never done sales before in their life, and they wanted to get into sales, any industry, what advice would you give them? I'll let you go first, Sean. Let's say, oh, <laughs> I will go first. Sean, Sean has to pee, everyone. <laughs> You know, it's a good question, Cody, just because simply that's what I was when I started the industry. I was 22. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the one thing that you don't, uh, you got to get them mentally prepared. I guess it just depends on, you know, in our selling profession, whether it be indoor sales or outdoor sales, which is your guys, right? Understanding what rejection means, you know, uh, you're now in an industry that gets more rejection than we ever get, right? Mm -hmm. Because... The difference between need and want, people, you know, they may want solar panels, right? right. Even though they need them, mm -hmm. they still still more of a want than a need. Whereas people sleep every day, so even though it is somewhat of a, they may want a better quality bed, mm -hmm. but they need a mattress to sleep on, regardless. In, in certain cases, so there is just a higher percentage, as we know, somebody walking through our door. There's a better percentage of earning their business, but then again, it goes about working their craft. And that young person goes through so many, not just mental things of uh, trying to figure out who they are, listening to the consumer. Um, you know, again, you were, you were a young cat when you started this, you know, between even the extracurricular activities outside of work cannot get, put you in the right mental state to do your work when you're there. So mm -hmm. it's, I guess if anything, if I'm telling that young person is that, again, you better be ready to go to work and, and listen. Listen to people that have done it, you know, but don't be afraid to also to experiment and try to have fun, you know, but it is, you know, it's a roller coaster. It's a tough job. You know, it, it just don't get too high and don't get too low. Right. We call that in the solar industry, the solar coaster. There you go. <laughs> so if... Uh... If you were if you were a twenty year old if you're giving advice to a twenty year old salesperson it'd be to get in something you really believe in protect your mental mental space on uh, and the preframe right the weather making sure that their their mental space is in the the right spot and what what kind of advice would you give them in entering the sales the sales career would you advise them to do self help stuff would you advise them to figure out their own lane what what do you think are the things that have when you were twenty two that help propel your success as, as it has? Dress for success. Okay. It's the thing that drives me crazy the most is when I see young people that regardless of whatever profession is, it's better to overdress than to underdress any day of the week, especially you when you're- in front of me? Yeah, I am. <laughs> hey, me too. <laughs> Did you iron that thing? No. <laughs> <laughs> but so many, so many people, and, and it starts even from the interview process. It's so frustrating when you see somebody come in for an interview and it's a sales gig and they're not dressed to be impressive. I mean, we all know in our business, everything's about first impressions anyway. Last impressions are mm -hmm. just as important. But if you're a young person, and how many times do consumers say, well, he's just young, or she's just young, so they didn't really know. You want to take that equation away from that part of the, the process. So sometimes for, you know, one of these guys, and I don't know if you know him or not, and he worked for, he worked for me for a long time, uh, it was even with Mile High Mattress was Justin Caitlin. Uh, Justin was a guy, long, long, skinny kid, um, but he always was, he had that really babyish face, mm -hmm. but he always dressed to the nines. He decided that, you know what, I'm going to take that away, and he would do little things. Instead of having a coffee machine, he'd have a cappuccino machine. He would do all these different things just to be able to feel important, but also at the same time, give that persona to the consumer. Obviously, again, actions still are a bigger part of that, and his knowledge was great. But you got to start somewhere. So yeah. take that equation away and just, you feel good about yourself too, For first of all. You know, you, you know, there's something about clothes, ties, shirts, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's got their frumpy clothes, their power clothes, you know, this is my, this is my kill em clothes, whatever it is. You know, have that thing. I know as a young person myself, I didn't have any money back mm -hmm. then. And so one of the goals was after every paycheck was to, and this was the days back where, you know, in the mattress industry, you had still wearing shirts and ties. 
So my wardrobe was like, you know, one tie and two shirts, whatever. But as I continued to progress, part of my part of my goal was to always add another piece to the wardrobe after every paycheck. Maybe be one tie, mm. maybe one shirt, and you know, just to continue to feel proud about it. But that's 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 it's not everything. But I would just say it's a good start. Yeah, I actually uh, I can relate to that. When I started at Mattress King, I had very little money to my name, and went to uh, went to. I thought you everybody got nice clothes at Men's Warehouse, so I went to Men's Warehouse, which was probably the most expensive place for me to get started with getting nice clothes, and uh, I had to very slowly get my wardrobe because you probably remember I wore the same thing a lot of times because I had to, to, to do that. But Sean, what advice would you give to a young aspiring business, business owner, or I'm sorry, salesperson? Well, first of all, sky's the limit. I mean, they, they're in control of their own destiny. They control their own paycheck. They control their mental space. Um, as you call it, they, uh, it's perspective and they they are in control of the, of their own check but um I don't know why I'm just thinking what Randy was I, I agree with a, a lot of stuff that Randy says I and I know I'm in the minority here but I don't agree with the dress thing um I I ne- I just never have I think when you dress like what you feel comfortable in mm-hmm. your true personality comes out and I think People want to buy from the person more so, or at least just as much as what that person is selling. And if that person is coming through as real and authentic, wearing a, you know, t- not saying you need a wrinkly t-shirt and, and jeans, but you know, nice jeans and a shirt and stuff, and it makes you feel more comfortable um, over wearing a tie and things like that. Um, I think you're more authentic and. And, and real and I think that that comes out um, as you're as you're talking to your customer as well yeah and you know I'm sitting here thinking uh, I think Randy Randy is uh, what Randy said is important there's everybody has their power outfit there are things that they feel most comfortable in and sometimes that's full button-up suit and a tie and sometimes that's a t-shirt and nice jeans and sometimes it's whatever you feel like you are the best version of yourself and I was just sitting here thinking, like, you know, should I push back on, on Randy, my mentor, in a podcast? And I realized, fuck it, it's my Cody show, so I can do it. <laughs> well, nobody, there's nobody. No he looks better than both of us. No, 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 I mean, no but no I'll, I'll tell you what, because of the question was asked about a young person starting off. True, baby face. I got you. And to me, not only just forget about the baby face part, but they're just starting off. And I get that what Sean and what you're thinking about is choice. Right. But in the same breath. As we said, it's not about us. It's about what the consumer is perceiving. And they're coming into a professional establishment. It doesn't matter. We've all done where we've been in jeans and T-shirts and whatever, moving stuff around. And sometimes that's our best days. Right. right. But at the same time, if you're trying to get a young person to try to learn and, and understand what this business is all about, I'd rather have them start there than give them the choice than being frumpy and whatever. Right, 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 right. And because it's, it's harder to go that other way. I, and I'll give you one minor little example. Uh, my wife, who's uh, she's powerful in her, in her own right with her own businesses, but she also does mobile notary on the side. And every time she goes to, and she does it for because she's got a real estate license, so she goes to brokerages and all that other stuff, but she's always dressed to the nines. She is just... And she comes back and she looks and whether she's in a brokerage house or going to mobile notary, most mobile notaries just dress casual because they don't think and they don't perceive that it's that big of a deal, even though because they're just going through the notion. But I guarantee you almost uh, it's probably 100 percent of the time she comes back and she says, you know what, every time I leave an establishment, they say, you know what? I just appreciate how professional we were, you know, how you, it just sets a whole different tonality about, because you got to remember these people are signing something big or something small, sure. but it's still part of their personality. It's part of their life and they shouldn't be part of the equation. And, and there's just something about when you have an individual that just doesn't look the part, you know, and doesn't feel the part. And if they don't know something that just adds on to the negativity to it about, am I doing the right thing? You know, is there something going to be wrong? Because if a mistake happens, 
you know, even in our industry, if if I didn't really feel that I was vibing with this salesperson because they didn't feel like they really gave a crap or whatever and they just sold me a rectangle and now I don't like it, it's very easy for me to just say, give me my money back yep. versus somebody that maybe I thought was more invested in me because they're invested in themselves mentally. But, yep, you know, I believe, I believe so. that. Yeah, and there's a level of professionalism there for sure that plays a part in it. But I was so, going to get back. I humbly disagree with both of you two. Okay. Well, <laughs> I wanted to go on record that nobody, nobody wants to buy from a tool and a tie. There you go. <laughs> I don't see you in a tie anymore. <laughs> I've got 90 million of them sitting in my closet. All right. So what's the most fun you've had in this in, in your selling career? I want to wrap this up pretty soon. But what's the most fun experience you've had in your selling career, which is a long one? Yes. What's your most fun memory? Oh, there's there's bad memories with us. Unfortunately, a lot of them uh, depend with Sean. But uh, we used to <laughs> we uh, we as a crew we used to do a contest where we would take if you hit a certain goal, then we would take the managers with us to Vegas. Oh, to, uh, products. oh yes. And, there we go. and uh, I will just say that uh, I think Sean, you were with us when we were at, up at the foundation room, and Tom Lai, who's not here, and Craig Morgan, who was with us. We were there was. There have been plenty of times in, in our little couple of outings in Vegas that we have, uh, not only do we have, we enjoy each other and have a lot of fun, but it is, I think it just, it helps with the synergy as well. I'm not going to get into the details of what we did and what we haven't done, but uh, uh, Vegas is always, uh, for that crew, especially those last three or four years uh, with Mattress King, that was probably the most synergistic time. We just had a lot of great people. It was just fun to, it was enjoyable to go to work all the time. Even with our, obviously, our nine-year running uh, fantasy football league that we had every year was uh, kicking the ass, too. So. I, I love that. And what happens in, what happens in Vegas, right? Yeah, well, it hopefully needed to stay in Vegas, so. Yeah. I'm actually going to release one thing that happened in Vegas I know happened on one of those trips. A secret in this room that needs to be released. Sean, you want you want to do the honors? You want me to tell a story about the time you pissed the bed? <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you, well, you caught me a little bit off guard. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, it was during one of the Vegas trips that Randy that Randy talked about when some <laughs> sales thing. I don't I don't even remember what the what the the deal was, but we. Uh, David Dolan, who was the owner of uh, Mattress King, all the Mattress King stores here, um, him and I were walking across this bridge, and I just body checked him, <laughs> body checked him into the into the wall uh, like as a hockey player. He body checks me back, and so we'd start. You know, that was that was part of the fun uh, aspect of it. We had been drinking quite a bit at uh, at dinner. Went to I believe it was Smith and Walensky. Yes, and and. Um, uh, yeah, I had had a number of beverages, and uh, I woke up in the went to bed. Woke up in the morning, and uh, the the bed was wet, and I just thought maybe I sweat or something because I had been been drinking. Nope, I peed the bed, and I <laughs> I remember I called Dolan. At, this is like six thirty in the morning. Right. I call I called him. We hadn't even gotten in, and since I get, think we got in at. 1.30 or 2 or yeah, something like that. It was 4.30, by the way. <laughs> really? Yes, it was. Okay. Well, I called him at 6.30. He answers. <laughs> the answers his hotel door. I go, I peed the bed. That's all I said to him. I go, I he goes, you're fucking kidding me. <laughs> I, go, I go, no, I peed. Yeah, I, I peed the bed. He goes, I think it's safe to say this is the last time we'll invite you here. <laughs> That doesn't even surprise me even a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't one of my finer moments. Or maybe it was. I don't know. It was still fun. All right. It was a good time, though. Uh, quick, a couple a couple more quick questions. One, a lot of people are talking about an economy coming right now that's going to be a, a looming recession that's coming this year in 2023. What do you guys think that businesses need to do? What What are the ones that thrive during a recession? What separates them from everybody else? Go ahead, Dole. You go first. The ones that refuse to think that we're in a recession. Um, okay, your own economy. I can relate to that. Regardless of what's going on outside your own, yeah, your your own economy is 
first and foremost. Um, and if you refuse to believe that shit is going down in the economy, you're going you're going to to do better. I, I I think again, it's it's all how you approach it. It's perspective, everything. Um, it's uh, and so so to directly answer your question, the 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 ones that uh, the the ones that refuse to believe that there's a recession. R D, what do you think? Well, I I guess it's in that same boat. Is if you think about it, regardless of recession, depression, whatever session, eschen you want to put in there. The bottom line for us is that the consumer that's walking through the door has, for the most part, disposable income. We're, mm-hmm. you know, I guess it's human nature that we always worry about everything. Mm-hmm. But, you know, even for Colorado, Colorado has one of the best unemployment rates in the in the country, right? It's whatever, it's a little less than 3% right now, which mm-hmm. means that 97% of the people that are still out there have a job. So therefore, those are the people that we're catering to right now. I, you know what? Yes, the other three percent—they're probably not walking in our door right now anyway. So why am I worried? I'm not trying to be uh, callous about it, but that's not the the individual that I'm worried about. We're we're concerned, and we want to help the ninety-seven percent that walk through our door. So that being said, even with you know, you can't buy into like what Sean just said: recession, depression. You just you move your you move your your chess piece. That's right. You know, in fact, we found out even in these last couple months, you know, the one thing about disposable income, I've been very fond of always saying, you know, you sell to the masses and you live with the classes. Mm -hmm. Well, right now, because of recession, whatever, the mass market is taking a bigger hit than than the classes market. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's it's always been a sacrifice for an individual, uh, regardless of whatever thing that's going on when they're spending $200 $200 or $500. It's a big chunk of their their savings. But the individuals that have disposable income that can afford to spend $1,000 or $7,000 on a mattress, they're not really worried about what the world is going on. They just want good service and want and want somebody to earn their business and that's what we do. They love that. to sleep regardless of the economy. Thank you. In fact, they even maybe, sleep more. Maybe a good night's sleep will help them. That's exactly right, Shani. <laughs> and and uh brace for the Randy, this question's for you. Yes, sir. You exude confidence, and <sighs> you have you kind of have the Conor McGregor, a, a more polished professional McGregor walk when you're walking a little swag walk. My question to you is, as a business owner or as a leader in your past, have you ever experienced imposter syndrome, and how do you handle that? <sighs> sure. I guess all the time. I mean, you know, what you guys talked about, I mean, you know, hey, this has been six months of starting up a new business, mm-hmm. and... You want to go into it with the right mindset, but there are plenty of times that you're uh, concerned, right? Or you're maybe not as strong as you need to be. And those are those things where, for myself, uh, you know, between uh, one, surrounding yourself around with great people that you can talk to, um, you know, and have support with. Uh, but the other part is just, you know, you don't have to hide it. I think you just need to embrace it sometimes. And uh, but just still power through it. I mean, it's just. I, I hope I'm answering your question right. But, yeah. But uh, you know, it, to me, I, you know, I, I'm not even going to make this a long thing. But it's it's I live by the four R's, which is romance, reality, reassurance, and recommit. And what you're talking about is that reassurance time. You know, when things are struggling, you know, what do you do? And a lot of times, people. If you talk to the wrong person, you're going to commit to doing something worse. Mm-hmm. If you talk to the right people, then maybe you're going to commit to getting back to the passion and romance of what you love. Don't make, don't get me wrong. We all go through that puppy love stage in the beginning, right? Mm-hmm. But reality is just as it's tied in with romance. So if I can live between romance and reality all day long, then that's where I want to be. But there are many times you're going to ask yourself, is this right for me? Mm-hmm. You know, is this right for my people? And usually that happens for... You know, figuring that out, it's always at the end of the month, right? Yep. <laughs> is this right for me? And what am I going to do this next month to be able to make it right? So that's, yeah, that's it. I'll take it. I love it. Then last question for you, Sean, is uh, I'm really excited about something you have coming up, a new business that you're working on. And wanted to get you to uh, to kind of talk t- quickly, 
tell us a little bit about what you got up your sleeves. Um, well, it's a coupon magazine uh, called, uh, called Coupon Confidential. And uh, it's basically a community-driven coupon magazine. We've, we've all seen coupon or community magazines and things mm-hmm. like that. So it's similar. I've got some twist. I've, um, in the interest of time, I won't really go into it. But, um, but, but yeah, I've got, uh, got kind of a little coupon magazine venture that's going to be a digital, digital and, and print mailed to specific communities um, around the city and and um, yeah, yeah. So it, it again back when I started, or we, my wife and I started Sleep Nation. Um, everybody thought we were crazy for kind of branching out on our own and creating kind of our own brand and things like that. Um, and I think everybody thinks I'm crazy for in a digital world doing a print magazine. And the way that I see it is um, <laughs> the if other people think you're crazy, I think you're on the right path, right? So I'm going to I'm gonna give it a shot, and um, yeah, I got that coming. All right, I love it. Well, with that, thank you guys so much for, for being on the, the first Cody show. Congratulations, Cody. Thank yeah. you, buddy. Thank you, guys.